so Dan uh, was kind of introduced earlier by our, our first speaker because of the links with, with the OGA and, and what Dan's doing uh, and the group at CVA are doing in terms of compiling all this data together. Um, so this is something that Dan's been involved with for a long time and over 20 years in the industry of, of working in, in different components and, and now works with CVA and is going to tell us a little bit about, about what they're doing in terms of um, improving access to data. So Dan, Thank over you to much. you. And if I may, I'm going to start by continuing the uh, conference exercise class that uh, Nick has started and Des has continued. Could you put your hand up if you are spending too much time finding, conditioning and preparing your data before you actually go to work with it? Does anybody have that problem? Okay, one or two folk. Um, could you put your hand up again if you do not have enough of that data to then find, condition and prepare in order to get your job done? Okay, a few folks still out there search for data. So, and the, the, the final piece of this puzzle. Who knew before Nick was talking about it today that the UK oil and gas operators are required to report when asked their petrotechnical data to the UK government? Anybody know that? Okay, there's a, there's a few in there. Who also knows that the UK government has the power to publish the data reported subject to certain conditions? Okay, pretty small number in the, in the audience now. And uh, yes, there's a few from CDA putting their hands up there, so that's, that's encouraging. <laughs> okay. So what we're going to talk about today um, is not so much about what you do with the data, but uh, how to get your hands on the data in the first place. So talk a little bit about what it's like at the moment. Um, talk a bit more about what it's going to be like over the next uh, couple of years. And then there's a, there's, there's a question to leave to think about, is whether what we are doing today with our data <laughs> is the kind of things we should be doing, given all of the changes that have taken place in the data landscape over the last uh, five or ten years or so. Before I dive into the detail, I need to explain why a guy from CDA is standing here talking about government data stuff. Um, CDA itself, we are owned by Oil & Gas UK, which is the trade association for the offshore industry, so we're a not-for-profit organisation. We work for the benefit of industry data managers. Um, we do a number of things around data itself, but we're also involved um, in things like developing access to educational courses and materials for data managers. So, no, Sakthi, can you just wave your hand frantically in the air for a second? So, so Sakthi is, is, is a great experience of uh, leading the development of and then partaking in the graduate certificate for uh, data management, and is also now leading an industry consortium <laughs> of uh, Chevron, Total, and Shell to develop a master's program in data management up at the University of Aberdeen. So, a lot going on to provide the education educational underpinnings of uh, how oil and gas data management works. Um, CDA was uh, established, though, substantially to assist in how oil and gas companies themselves manage their data reporting requirements to government and also manage the problem of how you move large amounts of data around between the individual joint venture partners generally formed in order to make the oil and gas industry work. So for the past 20-plus uh, years or so, we have been running what is now the de facto national data repository for well and seismic data in the UKCS. We have uh, 12,000 well bores, but data, data Data, metadata on about 5,000 seismic surveys and a variety of the other things that you would need in order to start to dive into what is the data that's available within the UKCS. So, how much data is in there? So, um, I'm, I, I look at some bits of literature, I, I see people working with data from 5 wells, 10 wells, 20 wells. This is our snapshot of the, the uh, what is the, the Northern North Sea area of the, uh, of the UKCS. And as, uh, as Steve showed earlier, as you put together the, the 4,000 wells that are more or less displayed there with, uh, on the UK side with those on the Norwegian side, there's about 7,000 wells all with data there in order to work on, um, nearly all of which are past their release date, so should in principle be available to, to us as members of the UK public in order to go work with. Um, and the rights to do that, so um, the, the rights for U uh, the UK government to obtain and then publish its data have been around since pretty much the start of, the, of, of, of UK oil and gas exploration and production in the UK. Um, the Petroleum Act 1998 um, and the model clauses to that act um, talk about exactly how this should work. So, um, licensees shall keep accurate records. So, uh, I'm sure every oil and gas licensee here is very familiar with those phrases. Um, of wells and accurate geological plans and maps. So, that does extend to surveys, if you interpret those words um, uh, 
favorably, um, they must deliver copies of the said records to the UK government when they request them to do so. And uh, after a certain period, the minister of the UK government is entitled to publish the, the data, um, so to make it, make it publicly available after the expiration of such longer periods as may be required. So typically three to four years in terms of uh, UK well and, and seismic data. So given that this oil and gas industry has been going for, what, 50 years, something like that, we should have about 47 years worth of data available to the public. It doesn't quite feel that way, does it? Um, why is that? So uh, um, I'm not going to pin any of this on, on, on Nick himself in terms of why we are, because Nick, Nick is the solution rather than the problem. But, over, uh, but if, if, if you look at how, how, how the UK government works, it, it's, a, it's a fascinating combination of both short-term and long-term incentives. So civil service exists to support the, the long-term purpose and delivery of, of government. Um, it's driven by political masters, which have slightly shorter-term goals, it must be said, and uh, increasingly short-term goals, if you read the, the papers over the next little while, which which means that in order to make all of this stuff work in terms of getting the data out there, we've had to deal with a certain amount of change within government. So this started with DTI back in the 70s. They became Burr, Burr became DEC. And, but that's okay, because all the way through this time, the, the oil price was yeah, reasonably happy. There's a few little blips before the, the, the 1990s. But generally speaking, the industry was a productive, profitable industry that was generating a a very good tax return for the UK government. So when you have many, many other fires to put out in terms of what governments have to deal with, this hasn't really been the priority in order to sort out questions like access to data and so on. That stopped more or less around about 2014, 2015 or thereabouts, um, when even though the oil price was up at about, what was that, $100, $110, um, realising the UK itself wasn't making any money out of oil and gas throughout the supply chain, how the industry was working, um, the, the, it was ceasing weirdly at $100 to be a profitable enterprise. So, so Ian Wood's review was set up by the government of the day to try and understand why this was and to establish uh, a, a variety of initiatives to try and put the UK oil and gas industry back on track. Um, not least of which um, was, was, was highlighted then by the, the fall in the oil price afterwards, which has very much put the, uh, the emphasis on how do you then uh, maintain the sustainability and the profitability of the UK oil and gas sector. Um, step one in that process was through now the uh, Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy to separate out its oil and gas function into the Oil and Gas Authority, so an arms length organisation somewhat more separate from the political day-to-day -day, um, goings-on in government, and able to think more strategically about um, various issues of the day, including um, how to, uh, access to things like data and the importance of data to oil and gas exploration. If you couple that with... Um, and if you take, um, so Google is wonderful in terms of trying to figure out what's going on in the world. So have a look at Google Trends and see what's going on with, with the, the frequency of terms like big data and that concept cropping up in, in search. You can see that from about 2012 all the way through to where we are today. We have a growth in understanding and industry of the importance of data, coupled with um, a, a, an enormous growth in understanding of the range of data technologies that are out there. This gives where we are today a, um, a perfect storm of the desire to get after oil and gas data with the ability through the, the, the OGA and its focus in this area to actually make that data now available to the public. This has resulted in um, three quite remarkable documents popping out over the last couple of years. Um, first is the, the Energy Act 2016. It doesn't sound that exciting, but this, this is an act of parliament that dedicates an entire chapter to data <coughs> stuff. Um, anybody who's a licensee should have a look at uh, chapter, chapter 3 of this, uh, of, of this document to understand <coughs> what's going on in there. So to have an active parliament about this is quite remarkable in itself. The OGA has published an information management strategy. This is a statement that the Oil and Gas Authority regards information management as a strategic thing to concern itself with. So that is quite a change from where we were beforehand. And thirdly, um, we have the... They're snappily titled, Consultation on an Increase to the OGA Levy to Fund the United Kingdom Oil and Gas National Data Repository. The OGA is going to the industry to ask for money to set up something in which all of the oil and gas data that's been collected to date can be looked after by government for industry. That in itself is quite a remarkable thing. 
So to follow up on two, uh, two, two speakers ago, if you want to know what gives data management people the shivers, people writing documents and publishing like that certainly does it for me. <laughs> there is some fruit on this already. So the OGA has already, and through its, uh, through its uh, public seismic program, has um, published data in support of the, um, the last uh, three license rounds, I think. So there's 80,000 kilometers of 2D seismic, uh, thousand data for over 1,000 wells, gravity magnetics, a wide variety of other data products as well, including field, pre-stack, post-stack products where available. Much of this is available for download. If you're after the field and the pre-stack data, we can provide that to you at cost on media. Or you can, again, talk to, uh, to Nick, who has a couple of, co couple of copies available on NAS drives and suitcases, which are currently being posted around the country. So you can get access to that at, uh, at, uh, at almost no cost at all if you can make the case to Nick to, to, to get access to one of his suitcases. Um, that's nearly 100 terabytes of data available under the open gas license, uh, sorry, the, oil and gas, the open government license. That's a license that's compatible with Creative Commons, so it truly does mean you can do what you like with it, as well as developing commercial products, incorporating your own products, anything you like, as long as you acknowledge somewhere in there that this came from the Oil and Gas Authority. They do like to get some credit for what's been done there. And if you want to download any of this today, just go to UK Oil and Gas Data, um, log on, create a free account, and then you can go and start to dive into the data, which is currently available thanks to the interest the Oil and Gas Authority is now placing on data as a strategic part of growing the, uh, the UKCS. What is coming next, though, is, uh, is even more exciting. Um, so the Energy Act 2016, there are regulations being made under that, under that act, which have been consulted on already, which will finally move forwards the regime under which um, data is retained by oil and gas companies, uh, is reported to the OGA, and then is disclosed by the OGA to the public. Um, so we retain, we report. Um, the regulations, I think, will be popping out in the next um, couple of months or so. The CDA and industry are working very closely with the OGA to try to come up with something which is fit for the OGA's policy directives, but also works well with industry in terms of how all this works. Um, the challenge, of course, for the, the OGA is how then do you disclose the data? So retaining is quite easy. The oil and gas companies do that already. Um, reporting, you can provide it to the OGA in the form and manner they require. But what do you need in place in order to disclose the data. Um, I think the, the, the key to this one has been given away already. Um, the National um, the Data Repository, which will come towards the, uh, the start of 2019, if all goes well, will be the source of which all of this data that is published will then be made available to everybody who connects to the National Data Repository, whether you're a licensee, an academic, working in industry, research, no matter what country you're living in, no matter what uh, um, job you're doing. Um, still a few details, as Nick mentioned, about the exact terms of how that's going to be done. But the NDR will make the data that has been collected by the, uh, the oil and gas licensees to date vastly more accessible than is currently possible. How do we do that? Um, well, I came back to this. So CDA is currently running the, uh, the de facto National Data Repository. We've been running an organ a, a collective membership-driven organization of nearly all of the UKCS licensees to date to help them report through CDA's UK oil and gas data system um, that data to government. It makes sense to us, given we have um, large amounts of data in there already, to work with the OGA to see if we can turn the UK oil and gas data system into the initial instance of the NDR and then hand that over to the, uh, the OGA to move forward and then develop truly as a, as a national asset. So we're working very uh, closely with the OGA at the moment about exactly how we might do that. And that should be with us in uh, early 2019, if, if all goes well. The final question I will leave you with here is, it's this question of, is what we are doing today this, the right things that we should be doing for tomorrow. If you look at what's happened over the past, and this is um, 20 years worth of, uh, of Moore's law growth, you look at the number of microprocessors on, on the chips which sit inside computers, that exponential curve of, of data processing power is still happening. The, uh, the ability to work with and do things with that data is continuing to grow at a remarkable rate. So there is a question as to whether the legislation that we've been putting in place at the start of this journey is the right legislation that will help us get the value 
from this petrotechnical data that all of these amazing big data technologies we've talked about to date should be able to realize. If you look at when, before the Energy Act came in, the last revision was made to the regulations which talk about what data must be retained and reported and so on. That was done in 2006, so what's that, about 12 years or so ago now. If you look at where technology was in 2006, so that's not even 2006, that is the first iPhone from 2008, so that's two years after this thing came on. If you look at where Apple is today, so we have the journey from that chap over there to that chap over there in just, what, 10 years of Apple development. Just think what else has been going on in industry which needs to be thought about in terms of how we put together the, uh, the rules and the regulations that uh, define what oil and gas companies should retain, what they should report to the, the OGA because it's in support of how you then maximize economic recovery of oil and gas from the, uh, the UKCS to do so. And then what the OGA may publish in order to support and grow and facilitate the, the, the use of big data, machine learning, all the other techniques that are out there. So is what we're doing today um, the right thing we should be doing tomorrow? There are probably a number of things we should think about. A number of speakers have talked about the challenge of data conditioning and a number of folk very kindly put their hands up earlier in relation to that question. The data that CDA has has been collected by the, um, the oil and gas companies and they've given it into UK oil and gas data for us to look after. That data is in the format that it was collected at the time. So if that's in um, 1970s, 1980s format, that, that's paper. That's some of the examples of not particularly well typed out um, reports that we've seen so far. Um, that kind of data is not that useful for a machine learning um, tool set to get into. Um, Steve has mentioned one of the targets of the oil and gas technology centers um, uh, call for ideas is how can we finally um, condition this data so that it is properly available to, to machine learning tools. It doesn't make sense for all of us to scan, vectorize, OCR, and do all of these things with these reports, with these data sets. It would make a lot more sense if we could do that once as an industry rather than have all of us, each of us, do that repetitively. What do we not have that would be useful today to retain, report, and publish? Um, PON9 um, will be carried forwards, we think, substantially into the new sets of regulations that will come out in the Energy Act. So what we will be asked to retain, report, and publish in 2018 is not going to be that different as we start off from uh, what was reported in, uh, in, 20, in 2006. But through, it, uh, through conferences like this today, we can start to understand what else is out there that we should be retaining, reporting, and, and publishing, so we can start to make more use of the technologies that are out there. So if you have ideas about where we should go next in terms of the data that you need, mm -hmm. that the oil and gas companies probably have, and that would be fair and reasonable for them to report in the OGA to publish, then don't come and talk to us so we can try and understand how we move the, uh, these regulations forwards as an industry so we can all be a little bit better in terms, in terms of how we do this. And finally, what could we create together to try and move all of us forwards? If you look at what, what happened at the, in the early days of, of image recognition, um, Stanford University put together a massive crowdsourced project around um, artificial vision um, through a project called ImageNet which was essentially taking Amazon's Mechanical Turk um, uh, environment and using that to get real people to look at lots of about a million plus images and in those images just categorize exactly what it was that was in there, whether it was a sheep, a cat, whatever, it, a car, a plane, whatever else it might have been. Um, because they did that, they now <coughs> have an absolutely massive, high quality, human categorized <coughs> training set which they can then take forwards and use to um, build out new models for machine learning, machine mm -hmm. vision. And they can also use that public training set to understand if current models being sold by various vendors are any good. We have the same problems in the oil and gas industry in terms of what does a training set for core image analysis look like? What does a training set for fascist description look like? Um, it strikes me that if we pooled our um, collective talents and resources together, we could probably answer as a group some of those questions around training sets and how we build the basis for machine learning, which would be quite difficult to do if we just worked independently as individual relatively small companies. So have a think as we talk through the, the rest of this conference in terms of how we can collaborate together to try and move these things forwards. And with that, I will stop. Thank you very much.